Hey, welcome to Grace United Methodist Church. We are glad that you are tuning in with us today virtually through our uh, YouTube link. We are just glad that you're here um, wherever you are in your living room, in your car. I, I don't know, but we're glad that you're here with us um, as we worship together in this place. And we are reminded through the words of Jesus that where two or three are gathered in his name, he is there in, in our midst. And so there are at least two or three of us here. And, um, and, and hopefully you have some folks around you in your home, but if not, know that we are corporately joining together in worship through, um, through virtual uh, technology. And so we are just glad that you are here with us and joining us. Um, a few announcements, things we have upcoming um, this week. Today is Palm Sunday, and it is the beginning of Holy Week. And Holy Week is a time toward the end of the season of Lent in which we focus heavy upon um, Jesus entering into Jerusalem and Jesus uh, toward the end of the week being put on trial, being crucified as we await um, Easter morning. So um, as we go into Holy Week this week, uh, just a couple of announcements specifically about Holy Week. Um, because we cannot or, or we are not able to gather corporately in person worship, uh, we will be having our Maundy Thursday service and we will be doing that the way we have the past few Sundays here at Grace. We'll be recording that, sending that out on Thursday. So be watching your email, watching social media uh, for that link to come through for the Monday Thursday service um, this, this coming up Thursday. Also, we're doing something a little different on Easter Sunday. We have not been able to gather on Sundays in person, but this Sunday, God willing, we're going to have a uh, pull-up or drive-in worship service in the parking lot of Grace United Methodist Church. We want you to come, we want you to invite your friends, we want you to invite your, even your enemies, you know, that would be even fantastic. Um, a good friend of mine is uh, bringing his sound system over, and he was more than excited to do that because when he found out he would be able to run the sound system and be in charge of my microphone, he said, I can guarantee those people, bless their hearts, will get out by 12, because if, you, if you're not finished, I will mute you. So, um, so that, that's the deal. This coming uh, Easter Sunday, 11 a.m., be in the parking lot. We're going to have a sound system ready and available. Um, we're going to invite you to roll your windows down. We will encourage you and ask you to stay in your vehicles with your windows down so that we can safely practice social distancing, as has been encouraged by our governing authorities and our bishop of the United Methodist Church. Um, if there were to be any changes to happen, uh, and, and what I mean by that is if the bishop were to say, we, he does not recommend this as cases of COVID-19 continue to rise in South Carolina or if the governor were, were to say you must shelter in place. Uh, we may have to make some alternate plans there. So again, be watching your email, be checking social media. Finally, in the midst of the work of the church, um, just because a lot of folks are quarantining themselves and we're practicing social distancing, um, the work of the church continues. And we want to remind you to continue to give and to give as God allows you to give to the ministry and mission of the church. Um, you can give electronically. That link will be provided with this email. Um, or you can drop your um, uh, giving off to the church office Monday through Thursday from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Or you may simply mail it to the church and, um, so that we can continue the ministry and mission of Grace United Methodist Church. Again, we are glad that you are joining in with us as we worship together. And wherever you are, I would invite you to join with me with the Apostles' Creed, these words that have been passed down from generation to generation in the life of the church, these words reminding us the basics, the essentials of the Christian faith, I would invite you to join with me now in saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. time I try to make it on my own 
Every time I try to stand, I start to fall Those lonely roads that I've traveled on There was Jesus When the life I built came crashing to the ground When the friends I had were nowhere to be found I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now There was Jesus And the waiting, and the searching, and the healing Blessing buried in the broken pieces Every minute, every moment Where I've been and where I'm going Even when I didn't know it I couldn't see it There was Jesus For this man who needs amazing kind of grace for forgiveness at a price I couldn't pay I'm not perfect so I thank God every day There was Jesus There was Jesus In the waiting, in the searching In the healing and the hurting Like a blessing buried in the broken pieces Every minute, every moment Where I've been and where I'm going Even when I didn't know it I couldn't see it There was Jesus on the mountains In the valleys There was Jesus In the shadows of the alleys There was Jesus In the fire and the flood In the healing and the hurting Like a blessing buried in the broken pieces Every minute, every moment Where I've been and where I'm going Even when I didn't know it I couldn't see it There was Jesus There was Jesus
God, this day we turn to you. God, this day we bow our hearts before you. In the midst of life, in the midst of just the normal stuff of life, but now in the midst of everything else in life, with things going on all around us. God, we can turn a lot of places the only place of hope that we can turn is you. So God, we turn our minds, our hearts, our lives to you. And we ask you to be at work. We ask God for you to work in the lives of churches and your people. We ask God for you to work in the midst of this country and this world pray for our president and all who surround him and the decisions and the struggles that our leadership has. We pray for other leaders across this world and we ask God that you provide for them, provide for them the wisdom they need to guide and care for the people in this world. We ask Heavenly Father that in the midst of everything that goes on around us that you would work to the good and you would do something amazing. We pray all this in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Shaken and stirred. As I typed those words the other day, now as I speak these words, In all transparency, this is how my life feels, this is how my heart feels, and honestly, this is how I feel, shaken and stirred. Today is Palm Sunday, and as we continue in this season of Lent, we are reminded that the season of Lent is a time for self-evaluation, a time to look at how our lives can become more like the life of Jesus, and, and oftentimes in Lent, we are called to give up things that are not about the life and the love of Jesus, and, in, and, in, and the idea of giving up things for the season of Lent, I read the other day um, that, that someone had said, they said, you know, this is the Lentiest Lent I have ever Lented. I mean, I, I have given up so much, and I never even intended to, to do that, but this is the lentiest Lent that I have ever Lented. In my almost 40 years of life, I have never experienced a Palm Sunday like this before. Uh, more times than not, you know, Palm Sunday is a time for celebration. It's a time where th there is uh, exceeding joy in the life of the church, in, in the congregation of the church, and in, inside the building of the church. There are palm branches that are given to every person who comes in, and then at a moment in the service, everybody is waving their palm branches and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Oftentimes, 
Here at Grace, we have remembered children singing or dancing songs of hope as they remembered the arrival of, uh, of Jesus on a donkey coming into Jerusalem where he and his disciples would celebrate the Passover meal. And it is toward the end of the Palm Sunday service that we would celebrate Holy Communion. But today, that is not the Palm Sunday we experience. We are shaken and stirred. And as I've thought about this, as I've as, as I wrestled with this sermon this week, I began to think that maybe, just maybe, this Palm Sunday today is a truer reflection of emotions that were experienced when Jesus rode this donkey into Jerusalem and folks were waving palms. And I say that because at this time in history that we remember Jesus coming into Jerusalem riding a donkey, people waving palms. At this point in time in history, really Jerusalem was a powder keg waiting to explode. And so today, the church building is empty. There are no waving of palm branches. There's no celebrating Holy Communion. There are no children running around. And as I referenced just a moment ago, again, in all transparency, I have wrestled with this scripture this week. I've been shaken and I've been stirred. And you hear those words shaken and stirred, and I'll go ahead and say it. I'll go ahead and throw it out there, if you will. You hear those words shaken and stirred, and some of you who are uh, familiar with James Bond, you're thinking, hey, no, that's not what I'm talking about. And what I mean by that is James Bond would often say, I prefer my martini shaken, not stirred. But today we're talking about being both shaken and stirred. See, many of us, maybe even all of us, we feel this way. And the reason I would uh, imply that maybe our lives feel shaken and stirred is because our lives have been disrupted in ways we never thought possible. If we think back on some other national emergencies, we can find a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of hope in, in that we were able to come together. I mean, even after the great tragedy of 9-11, our church attendance surged and people were able to find comfort and hope and gather community. But not today. It's almost as if we are experiencing a societal, worldwide earthquake, if you will. See, so we're shaken and we're stirred. We are shaken to our core. Our faith is tested. The normal function of our lives are stirred like the twisted wind of a tornado. We are shaken and we are stirred. We feel like life is out of control. And maybe, just maybe, we're beginning to realize that we actually have very little control in our life. And maybe you're even left thinking, what's next? But if there's any encouragement, if there's any hope, and if there's any comfort this Palm Sunday, this day, in the midst of being shaken and stirred, this is it. It's your takeaway point. It's what I want you to be thinking about for the rest of this message. And it's what I want you to be thinking about for the rest of this week as we travel through Holy Week together, awaiting to celebrate Easter morning. Here's your takeaway. Jesus is with us. That's why we sang those songs this morning, There Was Jesus, or today, There Was Jesus. I can't even walk. And so today is not the first time people have ever felt shaken and stirred. And maybe we've never seen or experienced anything like this before. This is not the first time that people have ever felt this way. And so today, we're going to read a very, very familiar story because it is Palm Sunday. We're going to be reading the story from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21. If you have a Bible, I would invite you to follow along with us. Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. And as we read these words, it is my hope and it is my prayer that we will find and realize that when we're shaken and stirred, Jesus is with us. Follow along with me from Matthew's Gospel. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. 
This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophets, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. So a story we may have heard many, many times, and we must ask the question, what's going on in this story? Here are Jesus, his disciples, they have traveled and have been traveling from Galilee. They're heading towards Jerusalem. They're headed to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover together, as they have done, I would imagine, a, a variety of times in the past. And Jesus and his disciples, they reach Bethphage, and about, they, they are actually about two miles at this point. They are about two miles before entering Jerusalem. And it is here that they stop. For whatever reason, we do not know for sure, but they, they, they take a stop here. Maybe it's to take a breather. But they're about two miles out from Jerusalem, and Jesus tells his disciples something. He says, I want you to go get this donkey for me. And some may think, well, Jesus was tired. He's been walking. Well, he, here's the deal. I would imagine if Jesus had walked that far, he did not need a donkey for the remaining of two miles. See, what Jesus was doing is Jesus was setting up something intentional and with purpose, and Jesus was inviting his disciples to be a part of that. So Jesus instructed his disciples what to do where to attain this donkey, to bring it to him. We read the story, and Jesus gets on the donkey, and he rides into Jerusalem. And what, what is actually happening here is, is it is a story of the past being acted out in person. What Jesus was doing is Jesus was bringing about the fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy from the Old Testament. You can read about that in Zechariah 9, verse 9. And what I find interesting in, in, in what was going on at this time is that in Jesus doing this, even some of his disciples did not understand what was going on. John's gospel gives us insight. They didn't even know what was going on. John tells us that his own disciples did not fully grasp what had happened until after Jesus' resurrection. They were just following his instructions. They're like, all right, cool. Jesus is going to ride a donkey into Jerusalem. All right. They didn't really get it. And so as Jesus is entering into Jerusalem, uh, Matthew tells us that there's a crowd with him, and they're, and they're placing their cloaks on the road. They're waving palm branches. They're placing the palm branches on the road before Jesus. And here's what we need to understand about the placing of the cloaks and, and the palm branches. The placing of the cloaks on the road symbolized the crowd's submission to Jesus as their king. They're saying, you are our king. And the waving of the branches and placing them down, that, that was a symbol of their Jewish nationalism. And they, they were convinced there is sure victory in this one, and this one is going to deliver us from our current oppression. And all of this is going on, and the crowd is, that's with Jesus is crying out, Hosanna to the Son of David, which is roughly translated, Save us now, Son of David. To the crowd that was there with Jesus, they were convinced, remembering some Old Testament prophecy, that there, would, there is a promise of a king who would come one day in the midst of life when it is shaken and stirred, and this king would be the one to deliver them. But that's not all that's going on in this story. Matthew doesn't tell us, but historians do. See, historians tell us that that was not the only parade, if you will, or entry into Jerusalem on this day. Jesus and his disciples entered Jerusalem on the east. But there was another parade that was entering from the west. And depending upon which historian you believe, the leading figure of the other parade was either Pontius Pilate, 
who was the Roman governor, or it was King Herod Antipas, who was a Jewish king, but he was a puppet of the Roman Empire. And see, it was tradition for Roman rulers on the high holy days, especially the high holy days of Passover, it was tradition for Roman rulers to enter Jerusalem from the west. And they did that for a purpose. Here they would come in, their leader on a war horse, surrounded by well-armed soldiers like they were marching into battle with their full battle gear. And they did this for a purpose. They did this to remind the folks, if things get crazy, don't you forget who's in charge. We're in charge. We have the mightiest military around. We are in charge. You defy us. We will crush you. We will destroy you. And so you have this king coming in with all of his entourage with nothing but full, intimidating force. And let's remember again how Jesus came in with his entourage. Jesus entered Jerusalem. Scriptures say, humble and on a donkey. So you have one king coming into the city with milita- military might, with power, with status, with, and basically the symbol of oppression. And the other king, with likely a smaller crowd, comes in riding a donkey in humility, in service, in love, and no sword. And for the king who is coming in riding on this donkey, before he ever reaches the promised throne that he knows is his, he will first find a throne on the cross. And what we find in the story are two very different kings and two very different kingdoms being represented and illustrated. And I point all that out because at some point in each of our lives, every one of us are going to have to choose which king and which kingdom We're going to follow. But that's not the end of the story. See, did we we hear verses 10 and 11? Because 10 and 11 say some pretty significant stuff. Verse 10 tells us that when when he, when Jesus, in all of his entourage, when Jesus enters into Jerusalem, Matthew says the whole city was in turmoil, turmoil. They were asking a question, who is this? And the crowds that are with Jesus say, oh, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And you may think, well, why, why are you taking the time to point out these two verses? Here's why. Matthew tells us that Jerusalem, the whole city, was in turmoil. And, and this is what we need to understand. Turmoil e- equals shaken and stirred. And here's why I say that. The Greek word that we translate as turmoil is the word from which we get the word earthquake. And so what Matthew was doing is he is setting up the context, setting up what's going on in Jerusalem at this time and saying when Jesus enters this holy city, there's a seismic shift, if you will. There's a clashing of two cultures. There is a collision of choices between which king and which kingdom you're going to choose. Are you going to choose a kingdom of power, an overwhelming force? Or will you choose the kingdom of humility and all-powerful love? And so as Jesus is entering into Jerusalem, everything is shaken and stirred. And did you hear the question asked? The question is this, who is this? And that's an important question for us to consider for ourselves because that is the central question of faith that all of us have to answer. Who is this? And we have to answer that question, and it is pretty important how we answer that question because the answer to this question is essential for our lives here and our lives to come. See, the crowd there said, Jesus, this is Jesus the prophet. It's either Jesus was a prophet or he is your Savior, your Lord, and your King. You've got to choose which one he is. As we come to the end of the story, and as today is Palm Sunday, maybe you're thinking, well, so what, Jason? What does all that have to do being shaken and stirred, and Jesus is with us, and, and this idea of who is this? Here's how it all comes together. Today, when we hear this question, who is this? If and only if our answer to that question is, Jesus is my Savior, my Lord, and my King, then there is hope. If you cannot say, 
to the question, Jesus is my Savior, Lord, and King, then you have no hope. See, the hope is that you know that you know in the midst of life being shaken and stirred, Jesus is with us. And what is also significant about being shaken and stirred is this is not the first time Matthew alludes to and implies to some kind of type of earthquake, if you will. In fact, in Matthew's gospel, there are at least three other times that Jerusalem was shaken and stirred. Matthew tells us in chapter 2, after Jesus was born and he is a, a, young, a younger child, then the, when the Magi come in chapter 2 to King Herod, they ask Herod, hey, we want to know about this king of the Jews. Matthew tells us that when Herod heard there was another king in town, that not only was Herod frightened and in turmoil, so was the city. It was shaken and stirred. Flip over a few chapters from where we read from today. If you go to chapter 27, you can read about the story of Jesus' crucifixion. And Matthew tells us in that story that when Jesus breathed his last there was an earthquake, there was turmoil, there was being shaken and stirred. And he says, so much so, the earth shook and the rocks were split. And not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but we know what's coming. When you get to chapter 28 and the story of, of Jesus' resurrection in Matthew's gospel, Matthew tells us again, there was an earthquake. And now what I find significant is in the midst of these four different times in Matthew's gospel, of Jerusalem being shaken and stirred, there is one constant. And the constant is that Jesus was there. And in the midst of being shaken and stirred, Jesus is with us. So here's the city of Jerusalem being shaken and stirred. It's the turmoil of the arrival of Jesus. It's almost like there's a state of confusion. And so maybe, maybe, maybe today you can relate. As Jesus is entering Jerusalem, some are celebrating his arrival. Some are scheming how to destroy him. Others are afraid of Jesus and just merely asking the question, who is this? But what it all comes down to is all in all, people are shaken and stirred. There are more questions than answers. And just like those on that day, so are we this day, this Palm Sunday, shaken and stirred. Because in the midst of all the confusion, in the midst of all the uncertainty, in the midst of things that we just do not understand or even have answers for, here's what we are reminded. Jesus is with us. And as we bring all this to a close, I'm getting ready to be quiet, I promise. There's something else significant about Matthew's gospel. It's almost like Matthew was intentional in letting us know that Jesus would be with us. Not only throughout the gospel, but it's almost like Matthew, I believe he did it on purpose. Because in chapter 1 and in chapter 28, we get the message that Jesus is with us. It's like Matthew wanted that as the book ends to the gospel. Because in chapter 1, when Joseph receives the news that he will be the father of this son of God, the angel tells Joseph, you will, he will be called Emmanuel. It'll be God with us. Then at the very end of Matthew's gospel, as Jesus has been resurrected and he is planning and preparing to ascend and he is prepping his disciples to send them out into the world on mission, do you remember what Jesus told his disciples? One of the very last things. He said, I will be with you to the very end of the age. Jesus is with us. So in this uncertain, in this ever-changing time of being shaken and stirred, remember Jesus is with us. This holy week, while we wait to remember the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus again, and in the midst of all of our lives that are being shaken and stirred at this time, remember Jesus is with us. And that's good news because it is only Jesus that truly has the power to change lives and heal this world. And let us be reminded again that Jesus is not like the Roman authority. Jesus does not do that with might and force. He didn't do it when he was here walking this earth, and he still doesn't do it now. 
Jesus continues to change lives and heal this world with humility, love, service, and sacrifice. And maybe that's what he's calling the church to do today and to know that he is with us. And we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves because it's only Palm Sunday. But church, we know the rest of the story. We know the rest of the story is that Jesus' story does not end on the cross. In fact, Jesus' story does not even end with him being placed in a tomb. The story actually only begins when we're reminded that tomb is empty. As we've been reminded time and time again at Grace United Methodist Church, we remember this truth. Resurrection means the worst thing is never the last thing. And so while we are shaken, while we are stirred, this is not the last thing because Jesus is with us. Let's pray. Well, God, we thank you for the hope that we find in your son, Jesus. That death itself cannot defeat the power of your love for all people. We give you glory, we give you honor in the midst of all the uncertainty, questions, even fear and doubts and worries we have. Holy God, remind us right now that Jesus, you are with us in our midst. As we enter into Holy Week together, let us take the opportunity to focus upon you, Jesus, and not all the junk of the world, to find peace in our relationship with you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So as a church, we receive a benediction, we receive a blessing, we receive this word from our God. May the ever-present, ever-loving, ever-caring God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, be with you. Amen.